My next guest is the singer who became a global superstar when she played Sandy in Greece. Since then, she's uh, dealt with serious illness, failed business ventures and divorce in the manner of a true survivor. Today, in her sixth decade, she's back on the road touring with a new album. Ladies and gentlemen, Olivia Newton-John. You look amazing. Thank you. Very good. You too. Thank you. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Golden oldies. Ah. Now, it's interesting reading about you because, because you've always got this milk toast and white bread stuff that's all been said about you. And that's been the image. And did, did you object to that at all? I think I was just happy to have any kind of image, really. Yeah. You know, I'm sure at, at times I would bemoan it and you know, go, I wish I was taken seriously, as we all do when we're really young. But looking back, I'm just very grateful that I had any kind of success and image. And, you know, since then, I've kind of done things to eradicate that a little bit, I think. <laughs> well, was it difficult, actually, resisting temptation when you came to England? Because it was the 60s, the swinging 60s, mm, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, and all that sex, drugs and rock and roll. Uh, do you never sort of been tempted at all? Which part of that are any you asking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think I avoided part of that. And, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My friend Pat and I were a double act, and we were yeah. touring around England as young girls in a little mini bus and seemed to manage to avoid all the drugs. I, don't, I know they were there, yeah. but we didn't see them. I think we had blinders on or something, but we managed to escape, OK? You played some fairly seedy clubs too, didn't you? Oh, very. Tell oh, me about very. them. Oh, goodness. Well, um, my friend Pat, who was my partner, Pat Carroll, was signed to Bernard Fund Agency and they sent, they were sending her out on some jobs and we decided to join up as a double act. And we went down to this club in London and it was kind of in a basement and it was called Raymond's Review Bar. I don't know for those in the audience who are old enough to remember this place. We all know Raymond's <laughs> Review Bar. <laughs> but we didn't know what it was. So we were just, you know, naive in our little pink mini skirts and... Um, went in and we noticed that there was a girl swimming around in a fish tank behind us, kind of just with a mermaid bottom on and nothing else. And we go, this is kind of strange. We didn't really think too much about it, being young and naive as we were. Did our show to a few men in raincoats, and that was about it. <laughs> and then at the end of the show, Mr Raymond came out back and, and paid us cash and said, thank you very much, but I don't think it's going to work out very well for you. <laughs> so that was kind of the, the crummiest place we played. But it's kind of hilarious when I think about it now, yeah. that we had no idea what was going on. But, I mean, then became this, this huge sort of superstar in the, in the record and, and, and pop industry. And then became this, this, this huge film star. Did you ever want to be a film star? I don't really think it was in my... Psyche singing was, was my thing, singing was thing and yes. I'd made a movie in Australia when I was about 16 where um, it, I just sang a song basically, but I, I was I, I did a movie and it, it wasn't great And I didn't really have any great aspirations for films. I didn't really think about it, it was just music So it all kind of happened in a, a marvelous way. Well, how do you did, how do you get Greece? Did you go for it? Did, did you audition for it? Did you, did you say oh, I must have that part or what? No, actually yeah. I was kind of the reluctant uh, Sandy because um, I met Alan Carr, who was the producer at a dinner party, Helen Reddy, who was a fellow Aussie, who was kind of the first Australian lady to forge her way across sure. into England and, and America. And Alan Carr was the producer and he was at dinner. And he was looking for Sandy and I guess he'd seen me and wanted to meet me. And I was very reluctant because I'd made another movie in England at Pinewood a few years before called Tomorrow, which was a space musical in a band that was kind of put together, a la the monkeys were put together, right, right. and it was a bit of a disaster again. So I thought, well, I think I'm going to leave the movies out and um, concentrate on my music. Also, um, I was concerned because I was 29 and the role was for a 17-year-old. I look back now and I think, what the heck was I worried about? But at the time, I was freaked about this. So anyway, they, I said, you know, I'll consider doing the movie, but I'm not sure, and, you know, I'd like to do a screen test. So if you can get me a screen test with the leading man, and I like it, then I'll do the movie. So the leading man was John Travolta. So yeah. it worked fine. <laughs> no, no, no John Travolta at that time. <clears throat> no, he wasn't really known. No, okay. that's right, because yes. the, the film that made his name had not yet been released. That's I mean, right. he'd made it. Yeah, Let's yeah. be reminded, of, shall we, of this, okay. of this movie. Let's have a, 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 one of the famous clips from it. <laughs>
Can you account for the continuing cult thing around that film at all? I do concerts and um, in the front row there'll be little girls, seven, eight years old, with their little poodle skirts and being sandy, with their grandmothers <laughs> <laughs> who came to it the first time. It's really quite amazing. How, how did you get into those trousers? Ah, you, I, I'm going to ask, I wanted to ask that question. Did, did you swallow a tape for them? I mean, what? <laughs> you know, like... I was really skinny. You know, I look at pictures of myself back then and my sister and I were really, really both pretty naturally thin and those pants did have a little stretch in them they're yeah. actually they were from the 50s they were made of that shark skin material now I've still got them actually and um, I wouldn't dare try and put them on now but um, <laughs> they were quite an amazing fabric and the zip had gone so they had to stitch them into I had to be stitched into them every day so I didn't drink anything from morning <laughs> till evening just about and then of course you had this other extraordinary episode in your life when was it the early 90s when, when you had the, the diagnosis with cancer, with breast cancer? Your father died, um, your marriage broke up, you had your Koala Blue a business venture went bankrupt. I mean, what else could happen to you? It seems you, to happen that way, doesn't it? Things well, I, happen well, in I don't know, does it? Yeah. I mean, you're still here, you know. Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. Absolutely. Tell me about the, the way when you were diagnosed as cancer, first of all. I mean, what, what was the, your, your feeling at that time? Was it shock, horror? What? Obviously, fear, which is. The first feeling, fear, denial, shock, all those things you go through. And um, especially the first few days before you really know, has it spread anywhere else? Or, you know, what is the, your diagnosis going to be? And then, you know, determination that I would survive this and get through it. But, you know, I had to go through surgery and chemotherapy first. But I had a young daughter and that was really my main, my main focus was, you know, I need to be here for her and didn't actually tell her about it um, because... Uh, my best friend had lost her daughter the year before to cancer and that little girl was Chloe's best friend. So to her, cancer meant you're going to die. So we made the decision not to tell her about it. So that was difficult, but, you know, the right choice for the time. How, how much do you think is, is, is the recovery, not due to, but helped by the mental attitude, by the, the business about, you know, this is not going to get me? I'm... Women who feel very alone at this time very often and it's wonderful if you can get together with a peer group of other women who have gone yes. through it. Like my, yes. my, my doctor, my oncologist put me in touch with another woman who'd had the same treatment so that I could talk with her about what to expect. And what did she say to you? Um, she said it's not as bad as you imagine it's going to be and she, she was already six months on the other side of it. She'd finished her course and just knowing that was yes. helpful that yes. she'd survived it and got through because I had this fear and um, I know other women have gone through this. At the time, I was too embarrassed to tell anybody, but I had the fear that they would put the needle in and I would die. I would be allergic to the, to the chemotherapy, and that was a huge fear, you know. Yes. So to get through yes. even the first one, I was like, yes, I got through the first one. And my friend Nancy, who had lost her daughter, who was incredible support to me at the time, um, took me to the movie. She said, we're going to do normal things, and we're just going to go do normal stuff. And we went to a movie right away afterwards and went shopping, you know, girly stuff. And... <laughs> um, it was, uh, you know, but like everything in life, all the difficult things you go through, they just make you stronger in the long run if you're lucky enough yeah. to survive them, so... But at the same time, I mean, I mean, I did a, the catalogue there of the, the sort of things that befell you at the same time. I mean, the divorce happened as well, didn't it? Yes. The, I mean, and you come from divorced parents, and so you'd been, um, I suppose, aware of what could happen, so therefore being cautious about committing yourself and hoping that this was forever. I waited till the last minute and still messed up here. <laughs> <laughs> No, I really, I did, I did want to have a child and I, I, I wasn't sure about marriage so I kept putting it off and putting it off and finally did it. But, you know, there's no guarantees in life and it just wasn't, it wasn't right. But, you know, we're still friends and we raise our daughter together. Well, she's grown now, but we have raised her together and it was just, you know, she was the gift that came out of that marriage. I mean, and this question is meant the best possible way. I mean, do you need a man in your life? Well, that's a very interesting question. Mm. I've never been asked that question before. Um... It's I quite think useful I thought of someone to take out the rubbish and yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice. It's very the nice. The cat litter tray. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, need need is a very strong word. <clears throat> you know, I think that if you've gone through very difficult things and you find out that you know we come in alone and we go out alone in in this life and you and you survive things on your own, but it's wonderful to have someone that cares for you. And I know that I have a lot of love and I'm very fortunate that way. You, 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 it's, the problem is, of course, the successful woman, the career, yes. and the career balanced against the man, the marriage, and the children, and all that. And that's the conflict that women have, isn't it? It's totally Which, thank God, men don't have. 
It is tough, it's yes. It's like the many armed Indian goddess. You know, you're juggling. There's <laughs> yeah. so many arms that yes, you need. Yes, I think it is very, yeah. it's a very difficult thing because you know, I'd like to have thought. I mean, when I was first starting out and I was, you know, a singer and came to England, my, I thought that I was going to have the white picket fence and the dogs and the children. <laughs> and it didn't, it didn't actually turn out that way and my career became this kind of a force in my life that I really loved it, you know, I really enjoyed it. And when, and when my daughter was born, I thought I was going to retire. And when I, you know, I had cancer, I thought I was going to retire. And I think I'm going to retire every year. <laughs> but there's always something, it's so stimulating and it's so interesting. And so, and you were talking before about being creative. The creative force is a very strong force. It's, it's hard it's, to stop, yeah. you know. Eventually there'll be a time where I just can't do it, you know. <laughs> but right now, I'm really, I love it. It's fantastic and I get to meet wonderful people and travel and you know it's a powerful drug but also um, tr a truly strong man is, is never threatened by your That's success true. a truly strong man will will really Support love you, you for what you're doing actually it's true all right now let's let's come up to date right up to date okay. because you've done a new album yes uh, and it's an album of, of songs that, that have played or played a particular part in, in your life yes these songs are uh, I made an album as a tribute to the women singers and the songs that played a big part in my life. And going back to when I was 15 and Joan Baez, who was my idol, right. I used to sing Where Have All the Flowers Gone. It was the only song I could play because it was so simple, a couple of chords on guitar. <laughs> and I sang that in a, in a you know, little coffee bar when I was a girl. And then, you know, I won my first talent contest with a song called Anyone Had a Heart, which Cilla Black sang. Backrack and David. Backrack and David. I actually, um, I was in the studio when Cilla Black did her very first uh, TV performance, of, right? Yeah. yeah. She, but 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 so you're going to sing that song? It's it's a lovely song. One of my favourite background Davis songs. Yes, it right? is a I great love it. Song. Okay. So your band awaits you over there. Oh, okay. So Thank Olivia you. Newton John.
Morva and the moment coming up, we'll meet Lauren Bacall. See you then. <laughs>